Hello, everyone. Good afternoon. How are you? Woo. Woo. This is the like slightly after the lunch energy, which is good. So my name is Tyler Doyle. I'm a product manager at Tableau. Some of you might recognize me from stage previously. Currently, I work on Tableau Catalog. This is where I get a little bit of an applause if anyone saw that this morning, right? Did everyone, so did you see the lineage diagram on the right there? That's what I've spent the last year of my life working on, and we were so excited to show it to all of you. But you know what the most challenging part of getting that lineage component into the product was? It wasn't figuring out the business model. It wasn't some deep, impossible PhD-level computer science. It was taking the idea of lineage, this complex, abstract idea of how objects relate to other objects, and making that lineage functionality have a great, simple design. And during the design process, my team had to learn a lot of things. We had to learn how to mix our goals of what we were trying to accomplish and communicate, make impact analysis simple, with the data that we were trying to communicate out to our audience, which is all of you. We also had to mesh that with how you might receive what we were trying to build. We think we landed in a pretty good spot. I'm sure you'll all let us know eventually. But I want you to think about that for a moment. How do you approach design? What are you really trying to communicate with what you're building? Do you want to learn? Do you want to learn how to do that? Yes? No? You guys don't sound very convincing. <laughs> the good news is that we have two experts on the topic here today, both Tableau Zen Masters and they're here to share the secrets of the common shapes and tips that all great information experiences have. Layla combines her background in art history and human-centered design to tell engaging and visual stories, like how many days a year it's actually hot enough to fry an egg on a sidewalk. She currently works as a senior data visualization designer at Visa. And joining her is Mike, a man of many hats, having been a graphic designer, editor, software developer, data analyst, and now currently focusing on storytelling with data, helping clients learn to tell their stories with principles of great storytelling and design. Mike runs the A Viz Apart blog, where he most recently wrote about how 90s web comics can teach us a thing or two about data viz. Did you not? Oh. Mike and Layla, thanks for being here today. And I'll hand it off to you now. Let's give them a warm welcome. I don't have a microphone on. Hello. Hi. There we go. We're obliged to tell you that eventually you're going to want to complete the mobile survey for our presentation. However, it's really obnoxious and annoying to have this happen at the end of the presentation when everybody, especially this week, is rushing to get to their next session in time. So what we're going to do instead of telling you at the end is we're going to tell you now that towards the end of the session, I'm going to say the name uh, Engelbert Humperdinck. And when I say the name Engelbert Humperdinck, that is going to remind you that it is time to go to the survey in the app and fill out your assessment of our presentation. So thank you all for joining us this afternoon. Uh, Layla and I are both passionate about the idea of design, both in Tableau and in data visualization in general. Now, we are both part of the Zen Master program here at Tableau, uh, and people are selected for this program for a variety of reasons. Nobody knows ever specifically why they're chosen, but we know that some people are technical experts. Some people are really good at knowing things about Tableau's server. Some people spend a lot of time on the forums or online helping people to learn about Tableau, and some people write a lot of how-to blogs. And we are not those people. So we'll never know for sure. But we suspect ours getting, getting Zen has a little something to do with uh, uh, several things that we have published on Tableau Public. 
Uh, now, even though we come from pretty different backgrounds, Mike has more of a writing and analysis background, and my background includes, as you heard earlier, a little bit of art history and some information science. We both kind of ended up in the same spot, at least in the Tableau community, and that is we've kind of gotten known to be more on the visual design side of things. So. We've met in person at the last Tableau conference, and it turned out that we actually had a lot of things in common. We realized that we both felt that collaboration was a valuable thing to do, and so we ended up collaborating on a number of projects over the course of this year, one of which you are attending right now. We also realized that there was a real need for a, a critique and feedback culture among our community, and so we ended up doing a lot of work on specific critique and specific feedback on our creations. It also turns out that we have a very similar uh, idea about aesthetics and visual uh, aesthetics, but as it turns out, it is not an identical view on aesthetics. It is definitely not identical. No. Uh, <laughs> but the other thing that we noticed when we compared notes was that we both uh, independently were getting a similar question over and over again. And that question was, how can I be a good designer? Or the more Eeyore version of that. I could never do the sort of things that you do. <laughs> so, if you have ever felt this way about your design work, I have good news for you. Is that everybody can be a good designer. And everybody can be a bad designer. In fact, we are all good designers and bad designers all at the same time. See, there's this secret in our field, and that the things that we normally think of as being design are not actually the things that make our work successful. The things that make our work successful actually come from a place that is beyond design. And so that's why we believe a better question would be, how can I become a better designer more of the time? So good design. It's something, if you're anything like me, that you've given some thought to. Mm -hmm. but it is kind of hard to put into words what exactly it is. But we definitely feel like when we see it, we know it. So let's put that to the test a little uh, bit. All Mike, right. You ready? Yeah. Okay. What do you think of this data viz? Is it a good design? Well, yeah, I think this is a great design. If you're not familiar with this, this is Kelly Martin's design, Bird Strikes Redo. Kelly Martin just inducted into the Tableau Zen Master Hall of Fame. You might recognize this from this morning's Devs on Stage keynote. This is a design that Kelly made six years ago in a Tableau, I believe, 8.2. And this is one of the designs that actually taught us that it was possible to use Tableau as more than just a business intelligence tool, that you could create beautiful and meaningful art in Tableau. So I think this is a fantastic design. I would agree. Layla. Yeah. We asked people in the community what they thought of when they first thought of what a well-known Tableau design was. And this is a, an idea, this is a visualization that kept coming up over and over again. So what do you think about this design? I think it's okay. Yeah? yeah. Not no, too bad? actually, it's one of my favorites. No. <laughs> so this is <laughs> one of Adam McCann's, who's a prolific uh, publisher and a fellow zen on uh, Tableau Public. And it's a, you know, engaging interesting topic, who doesn't love the Beatles, and beautifully done. Mm -hmm. So, let's step a little bit outside of the Tableau world. What do you think about this design? All right, well, I have a confession to make. I never really liked this design. And this Menard's, uh, Napoleon's March design, actually, I always found it somewhat impenetrable, and it didn't resonate with me in a way that it seems to resonate with everybody else who does data visualization. And eventually, I realized that the problem was that it's a design that rewards close reading. It is meant for somebody to look deeply into this design and then get very deep insights out of it. And once I realized that, I came around to appreciate it for what it was. So given this, Layla, what do you think about this design? I am happy that we managed to sleep in my favorite all-time viz. And I realize it might be uh, unpopular to say that this is great design, but if it's wrong to love this, I do not want to be right. <laughs> well, we all have our opinions. It's true. But then when it comes to deciding if a design is good or is bad or is something in between, how can we tell beyond using just our gut and our personal preferences? Well, there are some tools we have at our disposal, right? We have the idea of best practices. Best practices, things that 
uh, early pioneers in our field or well-known practitioners in our field have told us over the years are actually useful at people, for people to understand the visualizations that we are creating. But you know, it turns out that some of the time, the things that we call best practices are actually just people's opinions. So how do we distinguish the opinions from the facts? Science! Science is how we distinguish opinions from the facts. There are, yeah, <laughs> woo science. There are research labs at universities and at organizations and even here at Tableau Software that are constantly looking at how we process information visually and how we cognitively interact with the things that we see. We also can use things like chart taxonomies. If we have data type A and we want to show relationship B, then we should use data chart C. So all of these things are helpful to us if it comes to trying to avoid a bad chart. But these don't get us beyond that. These don't get us to here. So do we have any tools that help us beyond just bad design to get to really, really great design? We think that we do. We can use goals. So by using goals instead of uh, trying to just strictly follow every single rule, we are able to agree on what every great viz should be able to achieve or accomplish. And then getting there is still up to us and we still have the flexibility in terms of how we accomplish those goals. So thinking about design in this way is maybe a bit of a departure for some of us. So let's look into it a little bit more deeply. How do we think about design when all we can do is see the finished product? When we're looking at somebody else's design, what tools do we have to assess how we feel about that particular product? Well, since all we can see is the final product, we usually look at the visual elements. We can see the colors that they used, the font choices they made, how they used white space, or how they chose to encode their data. And maybe, if you're somebody who has a more of an artistic background, you might look more into the structure of the thing that you're seeing, the composition, the layout, maybe see if there's a visual hierarchy or some kind of visual flow to the product. And this is because we can't see into the designer's head. We have no idea what they were trying to do, we don't know the choices they made, and we don't know the constraints they were under. So now let's think about when we are the creator. How do we think about design when we are creating that design? Now, I want you to imagine for a minute that this is you. You are the creator. You're about to do some Tableau magic. That is why you have your Tableau magic hat on. You sit down at your computer. You start making a viz. You're making this information product. You're trying to make it as beautiful and as wonderful and as informative as possible. And then when you're done, you're hoping that you're going to get millions of adoring fans. You put it out wherever you can. And mostly what you're doing is you're focusing on what's right in front of you, that information product. Right. So when we use that approach, it's really easy to fall into the trap of focusing on just what's right in front of us, that awesomest of awesome visas, right? and uh, really uh, only thinking about the audience as an afterthought. But if we um, flip that around and we put the audience first, then we're really um, moving beyond just creating charts or thinking about the structures of pages or even dashboards, and we are creating information experiences. So you may be familiar with the term user experience. This is similar just for a more information-heavy uh, digital product, and uh, it basically is everything that the, your audience is experiencing from the moment they first notice your data product to the moment they decide to <laughs> uh, close out of it and, and go do something else. So of course, we want them to first uh, interact and you know take all those actions and really get into uh, uh, playing around with that viz, and then it also includes what they see traditionally kind of what we think of, uh, we think of what the audience's experience is. But it's also what they're feeling and thinking while they're doing that. Mm -hmm. Hopefully they look pretty close to the um, happy cat. And uh, finally, hopefully, it's also about what they learn um, from interacting with that data product. So then, how can we tell if those information experiences we're creating are good? Well, we have 
some ways that we've done that in the past. So uh, traditionally, we, we look at, is it efficient? Uh, this is something that's um, fairly easy to measure, right? So we can, uh, now that we know who our audience is, we kind of know what tasks they should be able to accomplish, we can test how quickly and accurately they're able to do that with our viz. But that kind of uh, focusing on or measuring whether we um, haven't made any of those bad choices, right? How do we, we want to move beyond that, right? So there must be something else other than efficiency. There is also, we can, we can strive for making our visits beautiful, but we don't necessarily, well, many uh, great information experiences are beautiful. Uh, they don't necessarily have to be visually beautiful. Um, so what is that extra magical ingredient? We think it is um, about those goals. So it is about um, if we are uh, shifting our perspective to putting the audience first, um, then our measurement should be something centered on the audience. And so what we can, um, what we can strive for is uh, measuring how much, um, how much the audience was able to actually uh, learn from that visual visualization and were we able to transfer some new knowledge to help them uh, understand the world in a new way. Right. So when we're talking about transferring knowledge, that leads us into something that I want to talk about actually a little bit deep, more deeply here. I want to go back to, let's talk about the oral history, like the oral tradition of storytelling throughout Western culture, right? So we used to have a person who told a story, we had our audience, and we had the story itself. It was sort of a triangle. And so we want to think of a version of that, which is the information experience triangle here. So we have us, we're the creator, and we also have our information product, that's what we're creating, and we have our audience. So you see there's a direct relationship between us and our audience. Hopefully we know a lot about our audience. We know who they are, at least, and we know what we want them to learn. And of course, we have a relationship with our information product because we are creating our information product. That is what our goal is here, is to make that product. But guess what? This is where all the knowledge transfer happens, between the information product and the audience. And where are you? Nowhere. You do not have a direct relationship here where the knowledge transfer happens. So what are we supposed to do? Your job here is to learn as much as you can about your audience so that you can create an information product that is going to do the best it possibly can to resonate with your audience and create a knowledge transfer. It's hard for us to let go of the idea that once we put our product out into the world, we lose control over it. But that is the case. So the first thing we have to do is understand our audience as best as we can. Ask as many questions as possible of who they are and what are they going to want to know and what are they going to want to do with the information you're presenting to them. And only then do you move over to creating your information product. Now in terms of our information products, imagine, if you will, that your audience has four questions in mind every time they see a new piece of information in front of them, every time they see one of your visits. You want your audience to answer yes to all four of these following questions. In fact, each one of these questions goes along with one of the four goals we should be aspiring to achieve when we create our information products. These four questions are, am I interested in this thing that is being presented to me? Can I use this thing that is being presented to me? Do I get it? And will I remember it? These four goals are the things that we are going to talk about for the rest of our time together today, how we can achieve these in our information products. So let's start by attention. Let's start by talking about how to get interested in things. Oh, yep. oh I thought this was a joke. <laughs> I didn't know you were going to actually put this slide in. You should know me better than that. Oh. All right, well, we're going to talk about kumquats for two seconds, and now we're going to talk about attention. <laughs> You're welcome. <laughs> Pardon me while I compose myself. Attention. So attention is, think of everything in the world as vying for your attention, right? In fact, you're here today because out of all the things in the world you could be doing, you chose to ta come to Tableau Conference. And of all the things at Tableau Conference, you chose to go to a session. Of all the sessions you could have come to with this hour, you came to this one. That's lots of different levels of attention that we had to get you to pay attention to us 
here today. So there are lots of different levels of attention we need to consider when we are creating our visualization as well. And the first level of attention is how do we get people's attention when our viz is out there in the world and could be uh, competing with literally anything else people could be looking at. That is initial attention. That is what I want to start by talking about now. To get people's initial attention, one of the things that is very useful is making things that are colorful. I'm going to show some Tableau Vizs here that have used this technique. Shine Pulikathara, former Iron Viz champion, created this Viz, which is just the way that he is using color gets my attention. And I want to know more about what it is that he is showing me. This happens to be about crime waves in the United States. This color palette is very bold. It doesn't matter if your palette is bold or muted. Yukari Nagata used this as her Twitter analysis visualization, which is a very muted, very beautiful visualization as well. And it also wants to draw you in. Other than color, you can be using organic shapes and unusual designs that, for instance, Adam McCann has used in this visualization about Bruce Springsteen. Now, you know I mentioned that these are organic, unusual shapes that he is using, and that is because the unexpected is another thing that is good at getting people's attention. A lot of the times what you'll see as we show examples here is that many of these particular techniques are used in concert with one another. So the unexpected can be visual. The unexpected can be textual. For instance, who cares? Who cares is a strange headline to put on a visualization. But it turns out that this Rob Radburn visualization is actually about healthcare across England. The title gets your attention and draws you in further into the visualization. This is a technique that is used by one of my other favorite creators, me. I have used this in this dog versus man visualization. If you are in New York City and you hear a name, is it more likely to be a dog's name or a person's name? <laughs> that is what this visualization is all about. But the dog versus man headline uh, mimics the man bites dog idea, so the cartoony nature and the title itself gets your attention. Uh, I like to go back to the well when I find that something works, so I also use this in my Twitter visualization. Do I like anything? These are all the tweets that I happened to like over a particular period of time. And this also leads us into the other thing that gets people's attention, which is personal things. Because at the bottom of this visualization, I actually put people's pictures, their photos in, if they were the people whose visualizations I liked, or whose tweets I liked the most. When you put people's information in there, you make the visualization personal and familiar. And people like to see, when they see things that is personal, or that's familiar, or that they connect with, that gets their attention as well. This is a visualization, by the way, that was shown at the keynote uh, earlier this week. This is one of my favorite visualizations of all time, Anya Ahern's Consumed. This is all about the items that she touched on a regular basis on a typical day. She breaks it down into what she felt was gendered or non-gendered items, or whether it was a need or a want. And this draws you in and makes you think about the items that you touch on a daily basis and how you think about them. Very personal. Also, none of us can spell Kaepernick or McGahee or McConaughey, or Kardashian. And Keith Dykstra made a visualization that played on that shared struggle that we all have. And by using these cartoony natures and letting us engage with this struggle ourselves, he made us, uh, uh, he got our attention with this visualization of his. On a little bit of a darker note, by the way, we can also use this uh, with when sea levels attack this. We're familiar with, for instance, the skylines of different cities. And this information is beautiful visualizations as I zoom in a little bit, we can recognize either the cities that we are in or cities we're familiar with, and we can also see how long it will take for those cities to be underwater. Okay. Urgency, by the way, is the last thing that I want to talk about. There's some sort of conventions around urgency, both in color and in text. There are things like help, stop, uh, so act now, supplies limited, things that we think of as urgent words. Also things like don't panic. This is how Neil Richards decided to start his viz about the Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy. <laughs> there's also, like I said, there's urgency of color and urgency of visual metaphor, which in this very famous Iraq's Bloody Toll visualization, a flipped upside down bar chart to emulate the blood dripping down, shows how many lives were lost over the course of the conflict in Iraq. OK, so we, by following similar steps perhaps, uh, got our audience to pay attention to our vids. Now, we need to make sure that they are paying attention to the most important parts of our visualization. So to do that, we have a very powerful tool we can use, and that is contrast. 
we have, our brains have evolved over time uh, to really uh, easily and quickly notice contrast that came in handy to avoid danger uh, and quickly spot it. But we can also take advantage of that in our visualization by using visual, some visual attributes that I bet some of you are familiar with. Do you so, want to, you want to go through them yourself? Uh, there sure. we go. First, movement, color, size. Uh, we could also use text as long as it's in a field of other non-text shapes. Intensity, shape. And one of my personal favorites, <laughs> alignment and white space. <laughs> so if you notice, the, really the reason uh, why all of those worked is because uh, they were surrounded by shapes, elements that were different. Um, so we have all this great variety of visual attributes that we can use to create contrast. The only thing that is really, really key to remember is don't ever use them all at the same time. Because then uh, your audience will just be kind of dizzy and confused. And allergic. Perhaps. So that's enough about attention, actually. Let's move on to the idea of usability. You, again? Not quite yet. Again with this. <laughs> All right, now, now I'm on the lookout. <laughs> you goofball. All right, usability. Usually when we think about usability, what we're thinking about is being colorblind safe or having enough contrast for people to see letters against backgrounds or that we can look at things in a, with a screen reader if we're uh, visually impaired. But usability goes beyond that. Usability is more about the experience of using the product that we're presenting to people. It's how does an audience feel when they're interacting with our information product. And there's sort of a spectrum of how we feel. It's broken, sad cat is the bottom level of this. I'm sure none of us have ever shipped a product in Tableau where the filters were broken when we launched it and we didn't notice, or the actions were broken when we put it out there because we changed one tiny thing on a dashboard and then everything. Yes, it's broken. Slightly better than that is, I guess it works. So I guess it works means it does everything it purports to do but at the same time, none of it works especially well. It's really slow, or there are obviously easier ways to get things out of this tool or out of this visualization that we intend to get out of it. And slightly above this is what our usual baseline level of acceptable is. This is something we all need to improve on. We need to be better than just this level of acceptable. How about it makes sense? How about everything in our visualization actually does what we think it should do and none of it does anything that's confusing to us? How about something even better than that, which is it gives me what I want? The implication being it does not give me what I don't want. We have removed all of the extraneous things that sometimes we are asked to provide every filter, every single slice and dice possible. We've taken out everything that our audience, that our customers do not need and made it so that everything that they have in front of them is actually useful. This, my friends, should be our minimum level of acceptable. And yet, there is still one more level we could aspire to, which is that it is pleasant to use. Hard eyes cat level pleasant to use. Meaning people actually want to go back and interact with this thing that we have created. So. Okay, so we've spent some uh time and effort and thought on making things usable, but how do we know that it, the thing we created is actually usable? So one thing we can do is to do a little thought experiment, uh, step into the shoes or rather eyes of the uh, user, the audience, and to do that there's a few things we can, um, a few kind of questions we can ask ourselves to, uh, let's say, encourage ourselves to be more objective about our product. So one is first kind of look away from your viz, step back, get a, a little new perspective, and ask yourself, what is it that I notice first? Where are my eyes drawn first? And is that where I really want uh, people's eyes to be drawn? And then uh, is it obvious to me where I should be focusing? Or are there a lot of uh, things on the page that are competing for attention? Uh, then think about a little bit of the interactivity in your product. Um, are 
uh, is it clear when I'm uh, first looking at this what exactly I can do with this viz, how I can interact with it, and does it work the way that uh, it appears like it should work? And finally, this is kind of like the core of the knowledge transfer. When I look at this, is it clear uh, what it is that I would be able to do, or you know, what question I'd be able to answer with this uh, data product? And, um, and is it, uh, if I go ahead and try to pretend to be on the user and uh, try to use the viz, am I actually able to accomplish that? Mm -hmm. So that is a little bit difficult to do, though, because if you have been uh, you know, staring at this awesome, beautiful viz for a while, a few hours, if you're more like me, it's, it's at least a few days or, <laughs> or more, um, a better thing you could do is you can ask a friend Hopefully, you have a nice friend like Mike who will um, humor you. Mm -hmm. And um, one example of doing that is uh, on a visit I recently, fairly recently created. So this was actually uh, about a quantified self viz about my previous year's talk. And uh, I was looking at how many ums I used and how I used them. Um, so, like. <laughs> I knew that was going to happen, but I really wanted to share this with you guys. So, <laughs> so if you want to watch the full two hours of critique, they are posted on YouTube. Uh, uh, basically, the first hour is the actual critique, and then the second is a few days later. Uh, it's actually, uh, I explained to my kind of the, the stuff, the feedback that I took and kind of what I did with it. And uh, I think it's a really good example of, of uh, good critique that is really a conversation. So I think that's really the most important thing to keep in mind. This is your baby. You know your baby very, very well. And you know what you've tried to do with it. You know what are your most important goals with it. Um, your friend is there to really uh, help you uh, kind of give, give a set, fresh set of eyes and see if you're able to accomplish those things. Right. And you can both talk through what were some of the design choices that either helped you accomplish those things or didn't help you so much. Right, and if you are the trusted friend giving this critique, remember, this is not your time to shine. This is not your visualization. You are there to help your friend achieve the goals that she has set out for herself. Because when you get too close to your visualization, sometimes you lose track of what it was you were trying to do in the first place. And you, the friend, can come in and make sure those goals are achieved even more strongly. OK, let's move on to understanding. How do we make sure that people are going to understand the knowledge that we actually want to transfer to them once we have put this information product in their hot little hands? Oh, again. <laughs> Enough, enough with that. All right. Is my attention worth the effort? This is a question that your audience asks every time you put something in front of them. Because what they have to do is measure the gains that they expect to get out of the visualization versus the effort it's going to take them to understand the information that you are presenting to them. And if you think of it on this sort of xy graph, where gains is along the x-axis and effort is along the y-axis, uh, we can actually uh, look at four different quadrants of uh, visualization types that uh, we have encountered on a regular basis. The high effort, low gains visualization, that is sort of like listening to an eight minute drum solo. <laughs> Nobody wants to listen to your eight minute drum solo, Steve. <laughs> When we make visualizations that are not considerate of what our audience wants or needs or are really just about us trying to do something interesting, this is our own eight-minute drum solo. You can do this in your own garage, but don't expect an audience to enjoy it. Now, sometimes you can ask your audience to put forth a lot of effort. And if it's a significant gain, that's OK. I sort of liken this to reading James Joyce. Now, not a lot of people are going to want to read James Joyce but the people who do are going to get a lot out of it. It's probably a small audience, but it's OK to have a small audience if they're appreciative of it. Actually, in my opinion, this is where the Menard viz belongs, the Napoleon's March viz belongs. But me, personally, I live in the bottom left quadrant. Low gains, low effort, looking at animal videos online. <laughs> I really like it. It takes me no effort. I see one, I move on to the next thing. But what we really should aspire to do honestly, is we should aspire to create information products that offer significant gains 
for as little effort as possible. That's like attending an Oprah's Favorite Things episode. All you did was show up and you got a car. And I'm... <laughs> Look under your seats, there's nothing. <laughs> Sorry. Um, but what we actually should be doing as we are creating our visualization, creating our information product, is we should be trying to increase the actual or the perceived gains that our audience will get from engaging with our product and or decreasing the actual or perceived effort they have to put in to engage with our product. And now we're going to talk about a few ways to do those things. So first, increasing the gain side of that equation. When we notice that we have an information gap, when there is something, uh, when what we know and the knowledge that is possible out there, there is a, a gap in that, we tend to really, really want to fill that gap. Now that might vary if we're maybe not quite as interested in the topic, but generally uh, this is kind of what sparks our curiosity and makes us want to go out and, and discover more. Um, so uh, in order to reduce, in, in, if you're um, not quite as interested in something, you can use the other side of that equation and you can make it appear or you can kind of show how reducing the effort um, it's not gonna take that much effort to be able to uh, fill that information gap. So if you think about it, that's kind of how clickbait works. Um, they kind of, uh, in even just the headline of it, you, it, it accomplished both, both sides of those things. So it uh, ha really highlights something that you should really, really want to know about. And then it also promises that if you click on that, uh, you will be able to with a very little effort and very little time, um, understand and fill that gap. <laughs> Welcome to our uh, celebration of clickbait. <laughs> yes. Not that we're encouraging you know, right. bad practices. <laughs> but so for the other side of the equation, um, uh, redu uh, reducing the effort that it takes to understand, um, there is one um, uh, pretty pretty good uh, trick that you can use, and that is using analogies and metaphors, uh, both visual and conceptual, to make uh, people understand things easier. And the way that that works is you're basically uh, taking something that is familiar to the audience and helping them understand something unfamiliar with that. And so I talked a lot more about that in uh, last year's conference on uh, metaphorically visiting, but this is uh, one of my favorite examples from my work that uses that, and uses both visual and conceptual uh, metaphor. And basically what it is, is uh, temperature data. It is uh, temperature, daily temperature from my hometown, Phoenix. And I could have just shown the temperature and how many really, really, really hot days there are in Phoenix. But instead, I presented it as a kind of translation of that uh, and um, presented as how many days are hot enough to fry an egg on a sidewalk. Now, I don't recommend actually frying an egg on a sidewalk. It gets kind of messy. And even though uh, most people or many people haven't actually tried to fry an egg on a sidewalk, it works because you've at least fried an egg on an oven. Uh, <laughs> it's maybe something that, uh, uh, a way that you've heard before of people describing a really, really hot day, and it's just very kind of visceral and uh, a little bit funny way of talking about the weather. So there's another technique, uh, aside from familiar versus unfamiliar, that we think is useful and actually has two meanings. And the, the technique we're talking about is you versus the data. So I'm gonna use a visualization that I made a couple years ago, which is called Assumptions, and it's about uh, surnames. This is US Census data, and it turns out that a lot of surnames in the United States uh, it's mostly people of one race have a lot of surnames. It's actually kind of easy to, if given a surname, to guess what race the person would be if they had that surname in the United States. So one you versus the data element is everybody's favorite subject is themselves, right? So if you make your visualization something that a person can look at and find themselves in, in any sense, they're more likely to try and engage with it and glean the knowledge from it. So in this case, this is made as a game. You select a name, you guess what you think the most common race of person is who has that surname, and then the viz will tell you if you are correct or not. So most people 
when they see this, the first name they pick is their own name. And then they pick their husband's or their wife's names, and then they pick their friend's names, and then all of a sudden, they're engaging with this visualization at a personal level. The other you versus the data is what did you find interesting in the data when you first uncovered it? Because whatever you found interesting in the data is likely what an audience will find interesting in the data as well. So what I found interesting in the data here was how easy it was to actually guess the most common race for every surname in the United States. So in creating this visualization and encouraging people to interact with it over and over again, they could actually end up coming to that same realization on their own as well. So how do I, under how do I know that what I'm creating is actually meeting our goals of making it understandable? Specifically, it's important to consider the knowledge gap. Make sure that it is obvious to your audience that what they have to do to get a little bit more knowledge is present in the visualization, that they know what they have to do to fill that knowledge gap. And if you're choosing to use visual metaphors, make sure that they are not gratuitous metaphors. They have to be meaningful if you're going to use them. Otherwise, they're not going to work. OK. Oh, thank god, this is not a kumquat thing. This is Spencer. This is Layla's kitty, who's one of my Isn't favorite adorable. kitties in the world. And he's sold me out down the and river. And he's also what a jerk. wanted to make sure that you knew that he's definitely on a Team Kumquat. Oh, well, great. Thanks, Spencer. <laughs> Retention and recall is the final goal of the four we want to talk about today. Turns out our memories are garbage. We used to be able to remember five things plus or minus two things. Now we have outsourced our memories to computers. We can remember four things plus or minus one thing. This is a problem for us. Because what we want is people to remember the things that we present to them after they're done looking at the things we presented to them. So what can we do? How can we make things stick in people's minds after they're done looking at our visualization? Well, there's two big things you can do. And these two big things I'll take in turn. The first big thing we can do is use text. So there have been studies done about when people look at a visualization and they know that they remember the visualization, they're asked, what is it that you remember about that visualization? And the number one answer that people give is the title. The number two answer they give is the data labels. The number three answer they give is the text under the title. People remember text. Use text in your visualizations. It will help people remember what it was they were supposed to get out of it. So the first big thing is text. The second big thing is repetition. <laughs> Why do you know your times tables? Why do you know nursery rhymes? Why do you know your favorite song from when you were 11 years old? It is because you have heard them over and over and over again, and repetition burns things into our brains so that we do not forget them. When we are creating things, we should be using text more and more. Use text in different places to reiterate the same message if that's what you need to do. Double encode variables on different things if you want to make sure that people are going to get the message. And as I say these things, I can feel the best practices crowd getting more and more antsy. Because it turns out that a lot of the things that help us to remember are things that are in direct opposition with best practices. Memorability, use all the colors. Use pictures and images. Make complex charts. Dual encoding is great. And none of that goes along with what best practices tells us to do. Because best practices are largely about making sure that information is communicated efficiently and cleanly. What are we supposed to do with this? <laughs> well, it turns out that we can't ever achieve all four of our goals at the same time. Achieving all of these goals requires trade-offs. And what trade-offs we choose to make is all dependent on our specific visualization, our specific audience. What is it that we're trying to accomplish? If we're putting something out in public, if we're putting it on Reddit and hoping that it gets tons of upvotes, we're going to have to put a lot of attention points into it, and we're going to have to relinquish some of the best practices side of it. If this is a business visualization, we know that we have a captive audience. We don't have to put so much into attention. We can put more of it into making the knowledge transfer easier to happen and the memorability higher. This is all up to you as a designer. You get to make these choices. this. All right. 
So I have this idea uh -huh. that you're testing me. How did you come up with that idea? Well, I think you're testing me because we had this conversation about kumquats a long time ago, and I said the only thing I know about kumquats is they score a lot of points in words with friends and in Scrabble. And she kind of made fun of me for that. So guess what, Layla? I went and I found out more about kumquats. Oh, tell me more. Well, kumquats are actually a citrus fruit that you eat like a grape. I bet you did not know that. I kind of knew that. All right, well, try this on for size. <laughs> Uh, the outside of a kumquat is sweet and the inside is tart, and that is the opposite of almost every other citrus fruit there is on the planet. Did you know that? I, I knew that one too. Okay. Sorry. Well, uh, maybe because you're not a middle-aged man with a middle-aged man metabolism, so That's you true. do not know that kumquats are actually filling and low calorie and they are a perfect snack for dieters like me. Oh, it's excellent. <laughs> so you know what I think about that? Wow. Kumquats, best thing ever. I, I love to learn new things, so thank you. All right, well, let's put an end to this nonsense. Okay. So, why did we put you through so many kumquats? Well, when they first made their appearance, their beautiful appearance, yeah. um, it was a surprise, and so it engaged your attention. Now, there's not a lot of usability we can talk about here, but it was at least a playful tone. And we managed your expectations. You knew that we weren't going to suddenly turn this into a kumquats presentation. Maybe until the very end there. But, yeah. So you knew that what you were going to get was the presentation you came to hear about and that kumquats were going to be a side bit. So we managed your expectations that way. And then we also uh, helped you to bridge that knowledge gap in a few different ways, just in the previous slide. Uh, so uh, Mike explained uh, what kumquats are using uh, a, a fruit that you are familiar with, so helping you bridge the uh, unfamiliar with a familiar. And then there was also a uh, fact that you may not have known that definitely Mike didn't know. And so that highlighted your knowledge gap. And then uh, Mike's uh, explanation of his interest in kumquats covered you and the data. <laughs> And you'll notice that every time we mentioned kumquats, we used an image of a kumquat, except for when we had Spencer up there, but we can <laughs> set that aside. And we also used the word kumquats every time they came up. It was on the screen every time we mentioned it, and we used colorful visuals every time. So the point here is that all four of these goals were in play for something that was an information product, even though there was almost no data associated with it. These goals work no matter what it is that you were trying to present to your audience. So let's go back now to our questions. OK. So originally we asked, how can we be better designers? And the answer is to uh, really change how we think about what it is that we're doing when we're designing. So if we are um, creating information experiences that are focused on our audience, um, then <laughs> Um, that's, so that means that um, we're, uh, to, in order to become, <laughs> oh, that's interesting. Okay, so in order to become better designers, uh, we don't really need to focus so much on ourselves. Um, so we don't need to know all the uh, most complex calculations. We don't need to know how to create all the craziest, fanciest charts. What we do need to do is just focus on that audience and focus on uh, creating information experiences that are supporting their needs uh, with whatever tools and uh, current skills that we already have. So then, what is good design? Mm -hmm. uh, when we uh, are focused on creating uh, audience-focused information experiences, uh, yeah. So when we put the audience in, uh, in the center, then we're creating not only uh, aesthetically pleasing visual experiences, we are really uh, engaging more than just the eyes. We're also engaging the audience's um, hearts and hopefully minds and helping them to learn and see something new uh, in that data. And finally, how do we um, create those information experiences and make sure that um, 
uh, they are a great information experience for that audience. We focus on those four key goals, attention, usability, comprehension, and retention. And we trust in our knowledge of uh, what it is, what our key goals are and what are the most important things that we want to be able to achieve. Uh, and then we kind of decide on which, at which proportion uh, we need to um, focus for each one of those goals. And that leaves us actually with one final question that we haven't brought up yet. And that question is why? Why should we bother to do all of this? Do we really need to be goals focused for every single thing we create? Well, you know, you can probably create something that's fun or informative or experimental and not follow all of these goals. And that's perfectly fine. But ultimately, don't we all want to do things that actually are going to make a difference, have an effect on the people that we are communicating with, make positive change in the world? Our feeling is that when you, design, when you have a design approach like what we've described today, this is the path towards creating things that matter. Now, all of you here in the room today already have the ability and you have the energy and you have the tools to do all of this. Right now, you can do all of this. There is nothing more that you need to learn. You apply the, the way of thinking that we talked about today, these goals that we talked about, focusing on being able to create engaging, attention-getting visualizations, understandable, usable, and memorable visualizations. You have the ability to do this. You have the energy and the tools to do this in your hearts, in your heads, right now. And when you start thinking about making your visualizations from this perspective, you'll find that it is much easier to create something that has a genuine effect on your audience, whether it's your community, your business, your friends, or the world as a whole. So I want to leave you with three thoughts today. The first, I want to thank you for coming. The second is Engelbert Humperdinck. <laughs> and the third is I want you all to leave here today and go out and make things that matter. So thank you very much.